On leap day, February 29th, 2012, Windows Azure, now just called Azure, also known as Azure, 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 and Asus, faced a major outage when its VMs, GAs, failed to generate transfer certificates, causing HAs to report the servers as faulty to the FCs, which would trigger automatic service healing, which would inadvertently exacerbate the issue and eventually take down the entire cluster. So this sentence makes no sense right now, and should be reminiscent of day one at a new software job. But I believe after this video, you will be able to rewatch this section and think, huh, it all makes sense now. Perhaps I learned something on YouTube today, even if it was just a bunch of domain-specific terms I'll never see again for the rest of my life. So let's start with Azure, which is just Microsoft's cloud computing platform. Though you may be more familiar with its competitors like Alibaba Cloud, Oracle Cloud, IBM Cloud, maybe even Google Cloud, the fundamental offering of these companies is the ability to rent virtual machines. These virtual machines are servers simulated by software, so a bunch of virtual machines can run on the same hardware, just like how multiple virtual reality headsets can run in the same reality. Anyways, these virtual machines are owned by Microsoft Azure, so companies and people like you can rent and access them through the internet. You see, rather than buying a bunch of hardware, fitting it all together, and maintaining it forever, you can simply rent all of this in the cloud. While they're not actually in the clouds, it'll be a few more decades before they figure out how to do that. When you launch a new Azure Compute instance, this instance maps to a single VM in a server in a cluster in a data center on the ground. For the rest of this video, I will be referring to these cloud compute instances as VMs, but these terms are totally interchangeable. AWS calls them instances, Microsoft wants to be different and uses VM instead. I wonder what Google calls them. A piece of software called the hypervisor runs on each server to launch customer VMs. This was likely Hyper-V or some internal implementation of it which is a Type 1 hypervisor that runs directly on hardware. Compare that to Type 2 hypervisors which run on an existing operating system such as VirtualBox which you can install on your computer right now to run Temple OS. This guest OS will be slower than your host OS, as the VM needs to go through the host and the hypervisor to talk to the hardware. This is fine for educational or hobbyist purposes, but for enterprise-level performance, Type 1 hypervisors are used to skip the host OS layer. So we know Azure uses a Type 1 hypervisor, yet in this image you see a host OS. Furthermore, when you read the docs, you see that there is a so-called root or parent partition which runs Windows and creates guest VMs. So what's going on here? Well, when you run Hyper-V, it transparently converts the original OS into a special VM in the parent partition. This host OS behaves identically as before. It can talk directly to hardware as if the hypervisor didn't exist and run Fortnite. But you can now easily manage your guest machines from the host OS. Although the interface makes it look like you're creating VMs on top of the host OS, it is actually making hypercalls to Hyper-V, which spins up VMs in the child partition which then talk directly to Hyper-V. So there are a bunch of servers running these hypervisors, and clusters of about 1,000 servers are managed by a fabric controller or FC, which provisions and monitors VMs in its assigned cluster. Dividing a data center into clusters is very normal. It lowers the blast radius if something bad happens to a single cluster, and it makes everything easier to manage. It's the same reason why a city is split into many districts, probably. Anyways, whenever an Azure customer creates a new VM, a guest agent or GA will launch within it on startup. The GA allows communication with the host OS, which has its counterpart called the host agent or HA. For example, the host agent may send health check requests to the guest agent to validate VM responsiveness. What matters here though is that the HA is also responsible for delivering application secrets, such as API keys or database credentials to the VM. These secrets are encrypted in case the goblins in the middle have infiltrated the network. In-transit encryption is done through the usual public key cryptography. On initialization, the GA generates a transfer certificate, which contains the public key, and sends it to the HA. This allows the HA to encrypt application secrets with this public key and send them to the GA, which can then decrypt it using its private key. These certificates also have an expiration date of one year in the future for security purposes. So the big brain logic used to calculate this date was as follows. Take the current date and increment the year by one. 
This is normally fine, except when it is a leap day, this date wouldn't exist in the next year, so the certificate generation would fail. And this is exactly what would happen here, right when the clock struck midnight at 0 UTC, February 29th. While this would be 4 p.m. Pacific for the employees at Microsoft, who were now in for a long night. A host agent receives a request to start a new VM and sends a hypercall to do so. It patiently waits for the initialization to complete, but little did it know that the VM was doomed to an unseemly fate. The guest agent starts up and tries to generate the transfer certificate. It nonchalantly passes in the expiration date it's been instructed to use, but that would be the last thing that it ever does. The GA errors out and terminates, leaving the VM initialization in limbo. The HA is still waiting. Seconds pass, then minutes, then dozens of minutes. Something wasn't right. The HA checks its clock. It's been 25 minutes. This was the longest that the HA was instructed to wait for an unresponsive VM. Let's try turning it off and back on, thought the HA. It reinitializes the VM, which attempts the startup sequence a second time. The same thing happens. The VM never reports a success to the HA. One last time, thought the HA, as it rebooted the VM once more. It had been instructed to try three times, because two isn't enough and four is too many, but inevitably the same result occurs. Now the HA concludes it must be a hardware problem and that something was wrong with the server. So it reports itself as faulty to the fabric controller and moves the server to a state called Human Investigate or HI. Since the server is now considered unhealthy, the FC begins transferring VMs off the faulty server to different servers in a mechanism dubbed Automatic Service Healing. This is the mechanism which would lead to the eventual downfall of the entire cluster. The VMs running on the server since prior to Leap Day are doing just fine, but under the FC's orders they are forcibly shut down and moved to a new server. They all begin reinitializing, but as expected, they all fail to do so. The FC is oblivious to the fact that it is basically infecting all of the servers under its control with the same issue, and continues to move VMs from HI servers to healthy servers. Two hours later, the cluster has seen better days. There are so many servers in HI that the FC gives up. It marks the entire cluster as HI, and disables all further automatic actions. Right, so all of this meant it was currently impossible to launch a VM, and your VM would be toast if it was caused in automatic service healing. But it actually gets slightly worse. The GA also restarts when it receives updates, and there was an ongoing deployment going out to update the GA and HA. So any clusters which received this deployment would also blow up. By 6.38 p.m., the devs discovered and had a good laugh at the trivial leap day logic and the fact that they weren't going to sleep for the next 24 hours. By 6.55 p.m., the engineers disabled customer management of VMs, which prevented them from fruitlessly deploying, updating, or scaling their applications, as all these would trigger automatic service healing and make the issue worse. By 10 p.m., they had a plan. By 11.20 p.m., they had the GA fix ready. Only those involved would know why preparing the fix to properly increment the dates by a year took five hours. By 1.50 a.m. the next day, they finished testing. By 2.11 a.m., they had rolled out the new GA to one production cluster. Finally, by 5.23 a.m., the majority of the clusters had been fixed. Why not all of them? Well, going back to 2 a.m. after they finished testing the fix, there were seven clusters in which the unrelated GA and HA deployment was in progress, so some servers had the new software while others did not. In the other clusters, they simply took the existing version and added the fixed GA, but here, there were two versions. They could add the fixed GA to either, but in the end, they decided to choose the old one, since it was time-tested and likely safer. But when they were creating this package with the fixed GA and old HA, they somehow misclicked and included a networking plugin from the new version, which if deployed would be a disaster since it was incompatible with the old HA. They had a second lifeline though, as according to standard practice, they must first test the rollback package on a single server to see if it even works. They did that and saw that VM started successfully and appeared healthy, so they were eager to go ahead with the deployment. So at 2.47 AM, they started blasting, which deployed to every server in all seven clusters at the same time. 
this incompatibility soon became evident as it would turn off network access for the VMs on the server, rendering them essentially unusable. To make matters worse, some major Azure services, such as their access control service, happened to be hosted in these seven clusters. So at 3.40 a.m., they prepared a new deployment which had the compatible version of the network plugin and tested it more thoroughly, before blasting out the fix once more at 5.40 a.m. By 8 a.m., these seven clusters were mostly operational, but a few specific servers were in corrupted states from being blasted too many times. The developers and operations staff worked furiously throughout the rest of the day, and everything was fully restored 18 hours later at 2.15 a.m. the following day. This was quite an extraordinary event. If something like this happened to AWS or Azure today, saying the entire internet blew up would not even be clickbait. Fortunately, this occurred over a decade ago when the cloud market was nothing compared to today. The slow recovery could be attributed to the fact that the cloud was kind of new back then. They note that they could have saved an hour or so on detection as well, as there were no alarms on GA initialization failures, only on servers being marked HI. But a leap day bug like this one is tough. Outages are usually triggered by deployment or customer action, both of which can be controlled to some extent by staggering and sharding. But according to my calculations, it turns zero UTC at the same time everywhere on Earth. So this latent bug would manifest on every Azure VM worldwide at the same time. To compensate for the outage, Azure provided a 33% discount for all users of these affected services for the entire month, regardless of whether or not they were impacted. This seems like a pretty good deal actually, and likely a sizable revenue loss for Azure, but it's all worth it for restoring that customer trust.